Uncle Doug. Ho. Oh. I don't know where you fall along the the taste spectrum of the Mars uh, confectionery company. I have a lot of thoughts about that. <laughs> yeah, I know we've yeah. talked about this on. I mean, this is probably what we talk about the most, and we yeah. should do a podcast and, just about about your 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 mounds, your almond joy. Yeah, and I don't <laughs> want you guys to snicker, but my my opinion's worth a hundred grand. Right. Boom. Wow. Boom. Doug was on deck with that. That was Dan, a, I, that, I that was improvised humor right there, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, very Mormon humor, and I think uh, jokes about confections are our wheelhouse. So, <laughs> what, what's your opinion, Dan? What's your favorite of the candy bars? Oh, uh, you know, I, I I love a lot of them. Uh, mm. I think what you're leading me to mm. is uh, is the youngest of the of the the candy confections. Yes, the, the Christ baby, chi- the Christ child of the candy confections, the the baby, if you will. Yes. Uh, one baby Ruth, yes. Uh, which who, I don't who know. Looks if like you guys... an old alcoholic baseball player. It never made sense to me, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, what we're talking about here is is the namesake mm. of that of said confection. Yes, um, Ru- the book of Ruth. Yeah, mm-hmm. was the named after now, the candy bar, obviously. Yes, yes. exactly. Um, now I'm gonna, uh, but uh, before we get to that, I'm just gonna say. I I am sorry. I know, guys, that we were all very disappointed last month when we realized that yet again, we had let the Jewish holiday of Shavuot pass us by unobserved. Oh my Damn God. it! How did we let that happen? Damn you, Siri! Why didn't you remind me? Anyway, as you know, Shavuot is the day that Jews celebrate when, on Mount Sinai, God gave the Torah to Moses and the Jews. I know, I know, you <laughs> thought Moses got received the Ten Commandments when he went up the mountain. Mm. Wrong. He apparently received the Torah, too. What a shock it must have been for them to be given a scroll in which was written the very story that they were in the middle of being in (laughs) and a bunch of stuff that was going to happen in their future. After all, Moses went up to Sinai in Exodus, so there were still three more books in the Torah that came after that. Trippy, man. Yeah. That's, anyway, that's that's where the term "scroll ahead" came from. Boom! <laughs> Nailed it. You are on a roll, man. You're on oh, fire. Doug. What's your anyway, secret? Is it the ginkgo biloba? <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 the uh, it's manna. Oh yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, Shavuot is a very strange uh, lesser holiday where people celebrate in several ways. They go to synagogue to pray. They stay up late talking about the importance of the Torah. They eat a meal heavy in dairy. You can insert your own Jewish di- digestion joke here. Mm. Uh, but one of the biggest traditions of Shavuot is the reading of the biblical book of Ruth. Oh, Now, along with Esther, Ruth is one of two books in the Bible named after a woman. Actually, that may not be true. For all I know, the Zephaniah or Haggai might be women. I have no idea on that one. Nobody does. No way to tell, really. <laughs> Nobody does. Uh so, one thing's for sure, though. Because these books are about women, they are uncharacteristically and very mercifully short for <laughs> biblical books. That's D- Uncle Doug's number one rule of the Bible. Boom, baby. You got to go for the, the lady books. Uh, Ruth is only four chapters long, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, now, you should know, I didn't choose the story of Ruth because it was a particularly interesting story or even crazy in some way. I literally just got curious what a book in the Bible that focuses on a woman might be like. Mm. So it's I thought, about you know why you I thought think. you chose it? Why? I, uh, a candy bar aside, which I know is a big issue for you, that that is the Mormon temple name given to your betrothed wife. That is true. Yeah, Whoa. that is true. And now, and now I can come to her and tell her I understand her namesake, uh, mm-hmm. and, and and soon you guys will be able to do that too. And, and you we'll can call her through the veil. We can, we'll all be able to call her forth in the final days. Uh, so I don't know whose wife she'll be in the end. I guess whoever says well, it first. Doug and I can just prank call her through the veil. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Doug's, Doug, you're actually the only one with uh, the holy Melchizedek priesthood, so oh, maybe you'll have to do it. It's I, on you, I, buddy. G- I gave that up about seven years ago. You, you, get, you, get a, you get a free Andrea out of it if you do it. So. <laughs> free Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> so, enjoy it. I don't know. Give it a shot. Enjoy your Anyway, <laughs> uh, so here's the gist of the story. The town 
of Bethlehem was having a famine, mm. uh, which seems careless of them. Yeah. Anyway, uh, a Hebrew man who lived there decided to take his wife and two sons and go to a place that, you know, had food. Uh, now, this guy dies immediately in this story, but he was a man, so unsurprisingly, even for a story about a woman, he has a name, which is Elimelech, mm. uh, which is su- what is surprising is that his wife also is named, and she is called Naomi. Mm. Hmm. Anyway, Elimelech uh, takes the family to the land of the Moabites, who aren't Hebrews, so we know they're likely bad people. <laughs> Actually... Fun fact, the Moabites are the descendants of Moab, who was the product of that time when Lot's daughters got themselves pregnant by getting their dad drunk and raping him. That's right. Everybody remember that? (laughs) Yep, that was Moab. Yep. Yep. So uh, apparently he did pretty well for himself because now he has a whole kingdom of people named after him. So Elimelech and Naomi make the grueling 30-ish mile trek to settle there in Moab. Apparently, that's far enough away that there wasn't any more famine there. Mm. I don't know. 30 miles? That's enough, I guess. Anyway, before you know it, Elimelech dies, so Naomi and the boys are on their own. But never fear, because the boys find themselves some cute local girls and get married. Oi, these progressive Jews and their interfaith marriages. (laughs) Good for them. (laughs) Right? Uh, So those girls were Ruth and Orpah. Who yes. we learned from Uncle Doug is who Orpah Winfrey was named after. <laughs> that's true. Which, which is a true. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Uh, they all lived their happy little lives in Moab for 10 years. And then, well, apparently the Elimelech uh, genes were not particularly hardy uh, because both of the boys die too. Oh, damn. So, no word on how this happened, but we now have three widows trying to figure out what to do with themselves. Naomi uh, has heard that they have that they canceled the famine back in Judah, so she decides she's going to go back uh, to her people. Both Orpa and Ruth decide to go with her, but she tells them not to come, saying that they should stay and find themselves new husbands there in Moab, which seems a little callous considering she seems to be the only family they have left. But whatever, they'll all get along, I guess. Uh, they cry together. And then the girls say, no, we still want to come and live with you. We'll come. Uh, But Naomi again says, no, I'm old. I can't provide you with any more husbands. uh, And we're super poor now. And uh, and I never liked you anyway. You go back now, you hear? You go back. Uh, Orpa was apparently, she apparently could take a hint and was like, fuck this bitch. And she heads back. But Ruth is not as good at taking a hint, and she is determined to stay with Naomi, no matter how hard she tries to get rid of her. She says the famous line, Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God my God. Now, that is the moment that the Jews celebrate uh, Ruth's big conversion to Judaism. But I gotta say... There is not much hay made about it in that book. Uh, the lines, that line is really the only word on the matter. And I got it in the context of this story, Ruth's religious conversion couldn't seem less important. <laughs> I, I've known lots of people who were converted to religions, who converted to religions to feel accepted by the people that they love and admire. The idea that this is some amazing change of heart where suddenly Jewishness is a big deal to Ruth is mm. really not borne out in the book, but. Whatever. Anyway, uh, they head back to Bethlehem. Boom. Moving on to chapter two. Now, uh, we have two unmarried women, uh, very impoverished, trying to make their way in Bethlehem. The famine may be over, but that doesn't mean that these two have enough to eat. So Ruth decides to do a, a thing that apparently poor people did. It was barley harvest time. So Ruth went into the fields after the harvesters had been through and collected any stalks of grain that they might have missed. Now, the owner of this field, Boaz, saw her gleaning and was impressed with her diligence. Yeah, that's it. Her diligence is what he was interested in. Sweet diligence, huh? (laughs) Yeah, she's got a nice set of diligence, if you know what I'm talking about. Oh my God, you're punctual. (laughs) <laughs> anyway, uh, he asks one of the harvesters who she is, and uh, that, well, that's not exactly true. 
he asks the more pertinent biblical question, who does she belong to? (laughs) Uh, Because women are not people, they are possessions. They told Boaz that she was the Moabite who came back with Naomi. Now, this didn't seem to faze him. He went to her and told her that she could totally glean in his field after the harvest, if you know what I mean. (laughs) Anyway, you go ahead and get what grain you can. I've told my men not to rape you or whatever, so you should be okay. Also, can you have you can have water from my workers' pitchers, and I'm super generous. Uh, so you know, did you know I'm rich too? Uh, <laughs> you could probably have a cu- huge crush on me if you wanted to. <laughs> anyway, uh, Ruth was like, "Why are you being nice to me? I'm just a piece of shit Moabite who isn't even high as high on the social ladder as your servants." But it turns out that Boaz was related to Elimelech, Naomi's husband. And he had heard that Ruth had been kind to Naomi, which he thought was nice. At mealtime, Boaz called Ruth Ruth over to him and gave her bread dipped in vinegar, which I take to be a good thing. Hmm. And (laughs) then he gave her... A little balsamic is nice. Yeah, sure. And then he gave her a a big shit ton of roasted grain, which, well, I guess that's also apparently nice. Uh, It was more than she could eat. So she uh, she kept the leftovers. She pocketed the leftovers. Uh, and then when she got up to go out to the fields, he told his men to leave a bunch of grain behind as they had harvested uh, or as they harvested so that she would get more. Hmm. He was a real romantic, this guy. Then Ruth went home to Naomi and gave her the leftover roasted grain. Sweet. And uh, and all the barley that she'd been able to gather, which happened, which was actually kind of a lot. And that's how they lived while the harvest was happening. Hmm. Chapter 3. One day, Naomi said to Ruth, Girl, we got to get you a husband stat. You're not getting any younger, and this whole leftover grain gig won't last forever. So what do you think about this Boaz guy? Now, Ruth was cool with Boaz, so Naomi came up with a plan. They knew Boaz would be winnowing that night. That's a grain harvest thing. Sure. So Naomi... I. The one rabbit hole that I really went down, other than the uh, the Jewish holiday rabbit hole, was mm. the grain harvesting rabbit hole. <laughs> but I decided to spare you all the details. Thank anyway, uh, they knew that Boaz would be winnowing, so they Na- Naomi told Ruth to put on her prettiest whatever the fuck they wore back then. I want to say burlap sack. <laughs> yeah. For the sake of the story, we'll just say her best clothes. Put on your best rag and tie it up with your best rope fragment. Yeah, exactly. Uh, she was also she also told her to wash and put on perfume. So you know, this shit was getting serious. That's that's good advice. Yes, it is. Uh, she said to go down to the threshing floor again, a grain thing, uh, but don't let him know that you are there. Hide behind the grain, I guess. I'm picturing her in a ghillie suit covered in barley stalks like a military (laughs) sniper. Yeah. (laughs) Anyway, uh, Ruth was supposed to watch Boaz. She would wait until he had eaten and tossed back a few drinks and then note where he went to sleep. Then she would sneak over to him. I think you know where I'm going with this. I well, keep, keep going. Jesus Christ. You know what? Fuck it. I'll just quote the damn Bible to you and let you guys figure it out. Quote, now this is Naomi talking to uh, Ruth. Quote, when he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. (laughs) To which Ruth replies, I will do whatever you say. Uh. Now, I submit to you that anyone reading this honestly that is to say anyone to anyone who doesn't have a desperate need to bend and twist everything in the bible to be pure and wholesome it is crystal clear what is going on here yeah right you have a young woman getting all gussied up and going to an older rich man to convince him to marry her using the only tools she has available it's a tale as old as time well, so and, and it this is this the only biblical story I'm aware of where some sort of consent was established, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there that that is that's progressive right there. Yeah, um, Ruth does this, and when Boaz wakes up in the middle of the night, he finds a uh, a sweet young thing lying next to him. Who are you? He says, "I'm Ruth." She says, "Spread your garment over me." 
because you're the big important man of the family. Now, yes, in a metaphorical sense, she is asking him to cover her, to bring her under his protection. But also, she is very literally telling him to let her into his clothing. Hmm. It really yeah. doesn't get any less ambiguous than that. I, I, I'm, I'm afraid I don't see where you can't, you know, it, this isn't sexy time. I'm sorry. Yeah. A hundred percent. And to be sure that we get what's happening, here's Boaz's response. Quote, the Lord bless you, daughter. This, this kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the, the younger men, whether rich or poor. Mm. What kindness? Uncovering his feet as he slept? <laughs> Asking for a corner of his garment? No. The only way that that response makes any sense is if she did some kindnesses for him. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, after that, he gushes about her for a while and then tells her to sleep next to him until morning. Oh, but she'd better scurry off before sunrise because we wouldn't want anybody talking. Yeah, that's, uh, the classic. that's a classic <clears throat> move, too. <laughs> exactly. The rest of the book is a bunch of legalese about how the guy was, uh, how another guy was actually a closer relative to, Ni to Naomi than Boaz, so he had the first right of refusal on Ruth, who apparently came as a package deal with Naomi's husband's inheritance, because women, after all, are property. Mm. Fortunately, though, the other relative wanted the land, but was less enthusiastic about Ruth, so he took off his sandal and gave it to Boaz which I guess is a, the weird-ass equivalent to shaking hands, and the deal was done. Boaz married Ruth, and they all lived happily ever after. So the book ends with this little tid tidbit. Boaz and Ruth gave birth to Obed, who then fathered Jesse, who then sired David. Mm. Oh, so, boy, that's a, that is a long walk for that payoff, isn't it? It Jesus. sure as hell is. Uh, quick recap of the story. The heroine of the Book of Ruth, quote, first marries a guy who dies, follows her mother-in-law back to her home, switches religions, sleeps with a rich old guy to get him to marry her, and eventually becomes the great-grandma of somebody famous, the end. There wow, what go. a necessary story. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I, it's funny because as I was researching this thing, uh, I was... I, I, a lot of Jewish uh, rabbis have expounded on this story quite a lot, and apparently, in the uh, in in the uh, Talmud, there's a lot of uh, like other stories, a lot of other le like legends surrounding this story, and one of them is that Orpa, the uh, the the Moabite woman who went back to Moab, somehow had sex with hundreds of soldiers. And all at the same time, Whoa. and yeah. that was and that was how she gave birth to uh, Goliath. Oh my God! So, <sighs> so she, who is the sister-in-law of the great grand grandmother of David, was the mother of the giant Goliath that David fought. I'm not sure how that works out. Uh, uh, and that doesn't but, that also mean that David and Goliath were like cousins? <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, that so, would be an yeah. interesting twist to the story. So right? there's a little family issue going. See, we didn't know that. We just thought yeah. they were, it was war, but it's clearly some, some cousin rivalry. Yeah. And well, so there you go. Speaking, Dan, you... really quickly to your, uh, to your um, when we were talking about women's names in the Bibles, I just kind of uh -huh. looked it up. And I'll uh -huh. read really quickly, for uh, if you don't mind, what, it's, what I found here. I uh, like it. Uh, Professor Carla Bombach says, one study produced a total of 3,000 to 3,100 names, 2,900 of which are men, with 170 of the total being women in the Bible. <laughs> However, the possibility of duplication produced the recalculation of a total of 1,700 distinct personal names in the Bible, with 137 of them being women. And yet another study of the Hebrew Bible only, there were a total of 1,426 names, with 1,315 belonging to men and 111 to women. 70% of the named and unnamed women in the Bible come from the Hebrew Bible. Despite the disparities, 70%, so that means there's hardly any in the New Testament. Despite the disparities right. among these different calculations, 
uh, it remains true that women or women's names represent 5.5 and 8% of the total names in the Bible. Um, a study of women whose spoken words are recorded found 93 of which 49 women were named. So good job, Bible. Well <laughs> done. Keep it up, Bible. Yeah. yeah. You're it's a, doing great. It's no wonder that we all call it the good book. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just because it's true, is it necessary? I don't know. <laughs> all right, Ruth. Yeah, let's, let's close the on. book on that. There's uh, there's not much use in that. Bye. 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 Moving on. Bye.